<clears throat> All right, everybody. Um, I've had a few people ask me about uh, lighting and just sort of how to set up some decent lighting and different questions about shadows. And um, so we're going to go over a few render settings and kind of some basic lighting setups that I generally use. Um, I'm not an expert at lighting or anything. There's plenty of other tutorials uh, that can teach you stuff, but I'm just going to go over some basics and some things that work for me in my general experience. Okay, so let me go ahead and just set up a few little things in the scene here so that we have something to look at and render and I'm not going to assign materials yet because we'll go over a little bit of that. Okay, so where to begin? Where to begin? Um, first off, I like to render in mental ray almost exclusively. I don't have a lot of reason to render in software. Um, so I guess we'll start by going over some mental ray settings uh, that are good for rendering. Um, so if you don't have mental ray uh, turned on, you just have to go in here, window, settings and preferences, plugin manager, um, and just scroll down and make sure you have uh, the mental ray plugin, this one, Maya to MR, which is like mental ray, uh, loaded, auto load. Okay. And then you can go up to here to your render settings. And let's see what we have. Okay, so by default, uh, I'm set to Maya software. So you just change that to mental ray. Oops, there we go. Okay, so the common tab is all the usual stuff. Um, you can set up stuff here for you know, whatever you want it to be named if you're doing some batch rendering and stuff. But uh, the main thing that we're going to mess with here is the image size. So um, a lot of times I like to render at full 1080p, which is 1920 by 1080. Uh, and then screen resolution 72. You would only change this really if you're going to be doing something for print or you know, something like that. But all the presets are in here too, um, including HD. <clears throat> okay, so that's generally what I do for that setting. Um, I leave passes alone, features I don't need to mess with very often. Quality is uh, something we're going to look at. So when you first open this up, usually it's preset to draft. So right in here where it says draft, um, you change that to production. Okay. And that's going to, basically, changing it to production just turns up your samples. So your samples here will, will go up to two, which is good. For a really nice uh, single image render, I'll sometimes up that to like three. Or um, sometimes I'll bring it down if I want to go faster render. And basically, that's just, you know, it's just going to control sort of the graininess and the overall quality of the image. But it's very expensive on render time if you turn that up. So, 2 is good. I'll leave it at 2. If you're just doing some quickie preview renders, then you know you don't need to necessarily be in production quality. Um, and I leave pretty much all the rest of this alone. Sometimes I'll change the, the filter to, uh, like, Mitchell. Um, basically, Mitchell will make, like, your edges and stuff a little bit sharper appearing. Gaussian is um, kind of the standard. It, it looks pretty nice. Box and triangle are faster, but like slightly lower quality. So um, Gaussian is generally what you want. That's this right here. Okay. 
um, ray tracing this is the other thing we're going to change here because I do want ray tracing because I use that for the shadows um, and uh, all that good stuff so reflections one is fine if I guess if you're doing like a really high quality thing with lots of nice reflections where you want one thing reflecting another reflecting another you know you might want to turn that up a little bit but it's you know one is fine especially for starting out when we're just going to be testing stuff refractions usually just one is fine as well there are some situations where you have to turn refractions up like when you're dealing with uh, cutout transparencies and, and different things uh, where you're casting rays through transparent objects and having refraction and using them to ray but that's that's all kind of advanced stuff uh, for what we're going to be doing refractions at one should be fine and then max trace depth here is just going to be reflections plus refractions so one one change that to two okay um, shadows and leave that fine for now but where it is just default is fine too and I'm not going to worry about really the rest of this stuff because it's not super important um, this is the main thing here is the ray trace settings and the, uh, the sample level um, and then we have indirect lighting which I use final gather a lot because it's easy to do and I can get kind of a like a sort of faked uh, global illumination when I use diffuse bounces um, and also I can use like a, a sky ball with an, a nice image in it or something if I need good reflections and uh, so final gather helps a lot with all that generally I don't use global illumination just because I don't want to have to set up photon emission and all that from all my lights so maybe I'll go over global illumination a little bit in another tutorial but that's not really something I'm going to cover because it's just not something that I use very often it's useful and it's nice um, but at the same time uh, it's just like more work in general and people don't always want to do more work when it comes to lighting they want simple so I'm going to show you the simple way of, of doing things that I kind of uh, use in most of my workflow so final gather I turn that on generally I leave accuracy at 100 if I'm doing a really nice render uh, I'll turn it up but 100 is pretty much fine most of the time um, this is a little trick I learned from reading something I don't, I don't remember where it was but uh, it speeds up the render time if you change this point density to point 0.1 and then change point interpolation from 10 to anywhere between like 20 and 30 is generally okay uh, so sometimes I'll just go, I usually I just go with 30 and it's pretty fast um, I guess it's just not like as as good necessarily maybe but I, generally I don't notice it and I also uh, it's it kind of helps um, with some of the staticiness of final gather that you can occasionally get if you're not using proper materials or your settings are a little off or something um, but anyway 100 the default I usually leave uh, point density to 0 0.1 and point interpolation to 30 is what I usually use and generally works well for me um, and secondary diffuse balances uh, typically I'll turn this up to 1 I don't necessarily um, put it up higher very often because it just generally doesn't need to be higher. It, it doesn't have a huge effect on render time that I've noticed though. So, you know, if you, you, you want to turn it up to two, that's fine. Um, but what, what that does is basically it's just saying that like light from one object is going to kind of bounce off. So it's like if I hit a red object with light, it, it'll, some of that red will bounce and hit you know, nearby objects, which is kind of faking that global illumination effect of, of light and color reflecting and bouncing. And so it's nice. Um, it just gives your environment a little more color and it, it makes things a little more believable at a pretty low cost to render time. So since I typically use Final Gather anyway, put on a little secondary diffuse bounce um, and that will generally make your scene a little bit nicer and I don't really worry about all the rest of the stuff that's you know, more advanced don't, don't need to worry about that right now 
Um, up here we do have image-based lighting and physical sun and sky, which you, you can use, um, but there's a time and a place for everything. I'm not going to worry about that right at this moment. Um, so I think that'll do it for render settings right now. I think uh, we'll move into talking about some materials a little bit. All right, so we have our scene, and we have, you know, if we click this button, we can see, okay, that's how it's all framed. So you can, you know, set up a nice little composition or whatever. Um, and but right now we don't have any lights, so if I hit render, it's going to go whoop. Render. You can see my final gallery is kind of working there for a second, um, but it's a pretty quick render. We're at a full 1080 and that rendered in 13 seconds. Okay. Um, and it's not super awful, I guess, because you know, a little final gather and whatever, but it's using just the default light. And the default light looks like crap. The environment just looks like crap. We don't have any color. And these aren't proper materials for Mental Ray. Mental Ray doesn't like just standard Lamberts very very much. It, uh, one thing I notice a lot is that um, standard Lamberts in Mental Ray, when they're mixed with Mental Ray materials, will often become like way blown out in, in color, like the saturation, the, the highlights and stuff. It's just like way brighter than it should be. So you generally want to eliminate um, standard materials uh, in your scene when you're doing Mental Ray, try and work exclusively within Mental Ray. So let's get some colors going on and talk a little bit about some materials. <sighs> Alright, so I'm not going to talk too much about all the different kinds of materials, but I'm going to show you uh, the architectural material that I use a lot. Pretty much I use it for everything unless I need a specialized um, um, shader for something. But so I'm going to assign a new material. I just right click the object, assign new material. And we've got our little panel here where we can see everything. Um, so I'm just going to go to Mental Ray here. And I'm going to choose this one, the MIA Material X. And that's the uh, Maya Architectural Shader. And the X just means that it's got a bump map. You can you can put a bump map on it. Um, the standard MIA material is fine as well. If you know you're not going to be using a bump map, you can use that. But you can also upgrade that material to use a bump map if you want. So it doesn't really matter um, which one you choose. But I'll just choose the, the X for now. And uh, so when I open that up in my attribute editor over here, I have basically the, the preset whatever that's up here and I don't necessarily want that. Um, generally what I do is I go to the presets button and I choose the matte finish um, and I replace everything with the matte finish. There's other presets in here that are really useful, uh, especially the glass ones are nice for when you just want to get some quick glass results. So like maybe I want to make this sphere with you know a solid piece of glass. I could replace that entirely. Um, and then there's all these different settings here, but you can see how it's broken up. Diffuse, that's going to be your color. Since this is glass, it's just making it black. It's transparent anyway. Um, you've got your reflection. It's pretty pretty much standard stuff here. Just, you, know, you can go through it. You should know probably what, what most of this stuff is. But diffuse, that's going to be your color. Um, weight, how how much that color influences the material as opposed to the scene, the lighting, whatever. Um, roughness, if you want the material to look like the surface is a little rougher. It's not really, uh, it doesn't add bump or anything. It's just sort of breaks up the, the, the way the material looks a little bit. I can show you on one of the other ones. Um, and then you've got your reflection. Um, there's some advanced reflection stuff I don't really mess with very often. Um, refraction, and you can see our index of refra refraction is set to 1.5 on this one because it's 
it wants it to be a glass material. This is a glass preset. Um, and then color here. I'll probably change this and, and make the color of the glass different. And if I brought down the transparency just a little bit, maybe it'll be like red glass. We'll see. Um, and then there's just well, there's a lot of other settings in here. Most of the time, you don't need to use or worry about any of these. The ones that I do use are the bump. I generally plug in my bump map to the standard bump here, and and normal maps and stuff like that as well. And then sometimes I use this advanced tab because there's a cutout opacity, which is nice for making like billboard things. But I'm not going to talk about that in this one. And also this additional color, which allows you to plug in like an additional Lambert shader and specify things like incandescence and uh, basically I just use that for um, glow effects and stuff like that. Like if I have a shader that has a light on the shader and so I'll specify like a special uh, Lambert and then a file in either the ambient or the incandescent area. But I'm not going to go into all that, that's like kind of off topic. So anyway, I'm just call this like uh, glass, I guess. And so let's go ahead and do the same thing and assign a few more new materials. So uh, I'll just do another material. And again, I like to preset the the matte finish because it kind of sets everything to like a base that you can then change change things from. Um, the nice thing about mental ray is that it doesn't. It's, it's an accurate rendering. It, it uses, you know, physics. So it's not so much you're faking the lighting and reflectivity. So if you want the object to be glossy, then it has to have some reflection. And, you know, that's how much light it's going to reflect is, is the reflectivity. And then the glossiness is kind of like how slick it is. So I can have a, a pretty non-glossy surface that still is going to reflect light. Most you know, things generally will reflect at least some light. So it's nice to have a little reflectivity on there, even if it's not going to be a glossy surface. You just bring the glossy down, and and that's good. This roughness is kind of kind of a nice little feature. Um, it's hard to explain exactly what it does. It's just kind of like if the surface was made out of cement or something, then it would naturally kind of break up a little bit more of the light. So it kind of diffuses, I guess, the light that's hitting it. Um, that's what it seems like to me anyway. But it's nice to have a little roughness uh, on certain surfaces. And of course color. Let's go ahead and make this one uh, you know, blue. Okay. And I'm not going to mess with refraction. Uh, the index of refraction is just one right now, which is basically just saying like there's nothing really refracting or, or anything going on here. Um, so let's do one more material on this one. Okay. And if you wanted to do maybe like a the metal, sometimes I guess, sometimes if you turn these on, the metal material, um, and, and then this would be sort of like a chrome, would be like a light gray here with like a dark gray here, with max reflectivity. But um, chrome, chrome really doesn't have, it doesn't look good unless your environment is you have to have something in your environment for it to reflect. And another good material for for uh, chrome is this DGS material here. That can be really nice. And you probably don't even need to really mess with any of the, the stuff in here. But um, I don't know. Let's 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 assign something else to it. Let's do a, oh, I like these metallic paint ones as well, and these car paint ones. These are really nice, um, especially if you know you're doing like a car. It makes sense to use a car paint shader. It's kind of the same deal. You've got the, the X one is like with a bump map, but I'm not going to use a bump map. And I think it, it starts out at this base of uh, red. You can change the colors to whatever you want, but 
this is what's nice about it is that it has see how it has like a, a an orangey red and then it has a red red and it's got you know all these flake parameters and stuff like that basically you can make it whatever color you want but it has uh, sort of like multiple colors in it which makes it feel more like car paint I guess is the easiest way to say that you know it 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 treats the light a certain way and it also has like these nice little speckles and, and flakes and stuff in it that it feels really nice um, so we'll take a look at that and don't forget about your ground plane generally for my ground plane I like to just assign a straight flat material so I'll do like a I'll come in here and do the matte finish and then I'll set it maybe to like a little bit more white if I want a little more white in there and um, so let's go ahead and take a render now that we've got some materials in the scene and see how it looks Alright, so you now we've got a little color, we've got some, you, know, you can see sort of those flakes and stuff in there, and we've got our solid red glass billiard ball looking thing, and we've got, you know, just sort of a standard flattish shader here. Um, you can also see there's a little bit of blue on the ground here from where that diffuse balance is putting some of that blue onto the white surface which we should probably see more of that but again we're using that default light and the default light is crap okay I don't care how good your models are how good your scene is how good your animation is if your lighting is crap your scene is crap so we're going to talk about now how to actually get that looking nice like let's talk a little bit about how to make the lighting work for your scene without killing your render time and without killing you know, killing yourself doing a bunch of work. So first thing I want to do is I want to change this little ground thing because I don't want all that black in the background. So this is just a quick little thing you can do. I forget what it's actually like the real name of it is but you take your background plane, turn it up, it's like 50-50 is good, it doesn't necessarily need to be that much, but we're going to just do it quick and easy. Okay, so you go to your animation tab up here, and create a deformer, and then you just go to nonlinear and bend, and it creates this little thing here that you can see, um, but you want to turn it so that it's laying flat with the plane, so just 90 degrees on the X, and then I also know that I want to turn it 90 degrees along its own axis, so on the Z here, another 90 degrees, and that's just so that it bends this in the proper direction, it's going to bend our plane, and then you can select this little input here that says bend, and make sure your low bound is set to zero, by default I think it's negative one, but I changed it. So 0 and then high bound is 1, and that's basically how the, the coverage of, of that bend relative to your thing that you're bending. So if this high bound was you know, set to like 0.5, watch the little green changes, now it's, it's half as long. So I want that to be 1. Oops, not 15. See, I said to 15, now it's like really long. Okay, so uh, set that to 1. And then go to your curvature, and I just clicked it, and I'm middle mousing here so that it's, it's changing that value. And you want it to bend so that this is basically straight up and not, um, you don't want it to curl over like this, but you want it to be like about here. You could get in your side view if you want to be real precise with it, but this is good. Um, and then just go ahead and delete your history. And that'll remove that 
a little modifier there. Okay, so this is facing the wrong direction for us, so I'm just going to turn it around. So there's 180, and I'm also going to push it back a little bit. I don't want my objects sitting right on the curve. And uh, I'll grab this edge here. Just kind of pull it out to give myself a little more green. I mean, I might want this to be a little bigger. Okay. That just gives us a nice smooth backdrop. So now we've got that. So we can kind of move our camera a little bit nicer. I don't want that to be higher. Okay. Now what I'm going to do with this, I don't want it to cast shadows. I don't ever want it to cast shadows because I don't want, if I have a light, pointing from behind this, I don't really want it to cast this shadow onto my object, so it would look awful. So I'm just going to go ahead and go to my attribute editor right now. I'm selecting the plane shape, go to render stats, and I'm going to turn off cast shadows. I still want it to receive shadows because I, I want to see shadows on the ground, obviously. Um, so that's, that's just a nice little backdrop. Um, I can render that, but again, we still have the default lighting. so. Even though we're getting a little bit nicer result already, we still don't really actually have lighting in our scene. We just have the crappy default light, which is not good and is never going to be good enough. And it also has like no real shadows. So, what kind of light are we going to use? That's another big question. Um, and the, the answer to that is really dependent on your scene. Um, I guess I'll go ahead and talk about the different kinds of lights real quick. If you look at this, we have an ambient light, a directional light, point light, spotlight, area light, volume light. Okay, we're not going to worry about volume light. Um, we're just not going to worry about that at all. And we're not going to worry about ambient light. Ambient lights don't even work in mental ray, uh, really because they don't work with mental ray materials, they're not physically accurate. Um, there's ways of like faking that and setting that up, but it's not, we don't need to worry about that. Directional lights are great. I love directional lights. I use them all the time. They're especially good for out, outside scenes because you're covering everything. A directional light doesn't have to fall off. Um, it's basically just a light that comes from infinity it just it just comes it's basically like sunlight um, things like that so uh, directional lights are just great you see it, it this is a directional light this is what it looks like if I turn on my little light thing here that might help us and we can just kind of point it in the direction that we want if I press T while I have the light active I get this little pointer and that's the target T for target and then I can point it like at whatever I want the light to point at so I want it to point right in the middle of our scene, and then I can move the light around separately. So directional light's nice because it just gives us everything gets lit up pretty much evenly. Um, I'm going to leave the intensity at 1, and we'll talk about shadows a little bit. Um, I'm not going to talk about depth map shadows because I don't use them very often. I mean, I'm using mental ray. I want realistic shadows. I want more for the physical kind of nice shadows. Not that you can't get nice lights with or nice shadows with depth map, but it's just not something I use very often, so I'm not really going to talk about it. So when I click this use ray trace shadows, I get a light angle of zero and a shadow rays of one by default. So let's go ahead and take a little look at what that looks like. So you can see our shadow is very sharp. It's it's just one dark, crisp-edged shadow. And that's not necessarily a bad thing. Um, in certain scenes, you want that. Uh, sunlight is is something that will oftentimes cast a, a sharper shadow, but um, it, 
in reality, light bounces around, and rarely is something going to have, a, like, a perfect edged, crisp shadow, unless you just have, like, a spotlight on it and no other lights on, and there's no way of light bouncing around and, and creating, uh, you know, a softer edge. So, how do we make it a little bit softer? Well, we can increase the light angle, and we can increase the shadow rays. So if we're going to increase the light angle, we're definitely going to need to increase the rays. So what's a good light angle? Well, generally I'll do uh, like three. Three is what I generally would do uh, almost exclusively, but you can change that up to maybe like a six if you want to. You can change it to whatever you want. But basically the light angle is where what angle is is of change is happening between the rays that are being cast so right now we're only casting one ray so light angle isn't really relevant to this equation um, but if we change the rays to say 12 or or 16 or uh, 18 or something like that then it's going to cast 16 rays right now and each time it casts a ray it's going to shoot it at a slightly different angle, which is the light angle. So right now I'm getting 16 rays with 3 being the light angle, which I'm, I'm guessing is like the degrees of change of the, of the angle. I'm, I'm not real positive on that. Don't quote me on that. But So I, I would say like, you know, maybe it's 3 degrees of change um, between each ray that's shot. So when we change that and then render you can see how the, the shadow is softened now um, but what you'll notice is that it's very grainy see how grainy that is you don't want it to be green if it's grainy then that means that you need more rays so generally uh, you can kind of double the rays to, until you get to where you want you might not need to go that high um, 24 might be enough in this circumstance, let's take a look. So it's it's maybe a little better, but it's still not quite what I'm looking for. Um, so maybe I would kick it up even more. So that's pretty pretty good. I mean, it's still kind of grainy. You might want more, but um, it's not it's not bad. It's not bad from its full actual resolution, which is like right here. So let me do a full render real quick and see how how everything looks. We also only have one light in our scene right now. So what you'll notice is that the render time is longer, um, and that's because calculating all those rays uh, is going to cost you. It's going to cost you in render time, and um, you know, 32 rays is a lot. Usually, I keep it around 18 for for not like really good quality renders. I'll just do do like light angle of three, and then shadow rays 18 generally. Um, but you can see this shadow is not bad. Here it is at full, full resolution. And it's nice and soft. If you want it to be softer, then you can change the, the light angle to be higher. Let's just render that with a little bit lighter. See, see how it's spread out more? So likewise, if you made that lower, then it would be a crisper shadow. So low number is crisp, high number soft. And then shadow rays is basically just to remove the graininess in the shadow. So if you have graininess and you don't want it, increase your shadow rays. It's really that simple. Um, so that hopefully that demystifies ray trace shadows for you a little bit. 
the ray depth limit is like when you're passing through transparent objects. Um, I'm not going to go into that right now because that's a whole kind of another discussion about transparency and ray tracing and refraction. I'm just not ready to get into that right now. So let's talk a little bit about some other lights we can use in examples. I'm just going to delete this light for now. Whoops. There we go. Okay, so uh, another type of light would be the point light. Point lights don't have a, f a focus really. They, they're non-directional. They're omni-lights, which means they're omnidirectional. They point in all directions around them. Um, and so with no decay, they'll point in all directions around them, basically with no drop-off, so infinitely at an intensity of 1 right now which is, it can be useful for lighting rooms and stuff like that, you know, where you would have like a, maybe a lamp bulb, you could put a point light near it and it would kind of mimic that effect. And you can also see here we're getting a lot more of that bounced, secondary diffuse bounce from our final gather onto the surface, which is nice. Um, and the t intensity is pretty low, so that, and it's kind of far away. Well, I guess that doesn't really matter since the decay is off. But so let's talk about decay a little bit. If I turn this intensity up to like five, and just kind of render this, we'll look at this red sphere for this. Okay. So at an intensity of five, we're getting pretty nice light just kind of shooting onto everything in all directions from this point light. If I turn on linear decay, there's now a drop off. So as the light travels from the light into space to whatever it's it's going towards, um, it's going to lose lose intensity. It's it's going to get lost and become less powerful. So like if I put this light right near the surface we'll be able to see this. I can do a little render here. It's hard to see uh, hardly any light because now the, the light is dropping off and it's losing intensity over distance and so that intensity of 5 is no longer adequate. Um, basically linear decay means that it's dropping off linearly if, if you were to look at it on a graph where there's light intensity versus distance the line would be straight and and as you travel a further distance the intensity would decrease at an equal rate um, whereas quadratic would be like the intensity I believe would be like four times uh, greater loss of intensity but it's it's math so don't worry about it too much but basically just know that Quadratic is more accurate. It's, it's like real real life, but it also depends on your, your world scale, and there's a lot of different factors in there. But generally, um, for for this kind of scale, if you're not worried about like real world physical accuracy, you know, linear can be nice. It can be convincing, and generally you have to turn your intensity up to like ten times what what you would need. Um, if you were to have no decay. So that, that's not like an exact number or anything, that's just something I've noticed is kind of like if you need one intensity with no decay, you might need 10 intensity on linear and you might need as much as 100 in quadratic or well, maybe more, maybe less. It just depends a lot on the scene. You're getting a whole lot of light reflecting off of that, bouncing off of that all there and also up to here. 
But um, yeah, point lights are, are they can be useful um, for lighting up like an area because they're omnidirectional, but I really don't use them very often because they're not focused. They don't focus on what it is that you're trying to, to look at. So let's go on to the next thing. Let's talk a little bit about spotlights. Spotlights are great because you get exactly what you want lit up. So in this case, we're trying to light really this whole scene of, of all three objects. So I've got my spotlight, but the problem is that it's only really lighting up that red ball right now. So if I pull it farther back, I get a little bit more in the scene, in, in the light. But that's still not very good. It's not quite what I want. So this is where we go into our spotlight settings here. I'm going to go ahead and leave the decay at none. Um, and you see we have a cone angle, a penumbra angle, and a drop off. These are important. They're unique to your spotlights. And we're going to talk about what all that means and what they need to be set at. So if I go ahead and take a render right now, we have a spot that's lit up from our spotlight. This might be exactly what you want, but oftentimes I find this is the opposite of what people want. Um, because this is just really a sharp edge. It looks ugly. Half the scene is so completely dark you can't see anything. And it's just not enough. It's not quality lighting. So how do we make this light better? Well, the first thing we can do is increase the cone angle. Now, if you watch the light while I increase the cone angle, you'll notice how it kind of widens. And so it's able to get a larger target area in its view. So generally, I go ahead and pick this up anywhere between 80 to 140, depending on what my scene requires and how large it is. I don't necessarily use spotlights a lot in my work. Um, a lot of times I'll just go ahead and use uh, directional lights or occasionally uh, area lights, but spotlights are great. So if I kick this up to like 80, that's probably enough. We still get a little bit of dark in there. And if we go ahead and render it now, let's see what we get. Okay, so now we can see all of our objects. That's good. But we still have a really sharp uh, you know, ink edge where the, the light meets the lack of light. I'm not going to say shadow because it's not really a shadow. It's just not lit up. Um, so we need to soften this edge. And that's where penumbra angle and drop off come in. Penumbra angle can go in the negative or the positive. Um, by default they go to like negative 10, positive 10. Um, I like to do it to negative 5 almost every time I use a spotlight. And I'll show you what that looks like. See how it's softened the, the edge there? Okay. Now in if we were to go into the positive 5 you'll see a difference. So it's basically ex kind of softening that edge, but it's softening it either inward, which would be negative 5, or outward, which would be you know, the positive 5. And I find that sometimes when you're going into the positive direction, it doesn't look quite right. You can kind of see a line there still. So that's why I go with the negative. I just It's a personal preference. I prefer the negative 5. I think that it's nicer. You could make that distance more if you wanted to. Um, but we also have this drop-off value, which is very useful. Um, if you see here, you can see that it's softening. It's just softening. I've set the penumbra back to 0 just so we can see this change. Um, 
and that, that can go quite high, but generally uh, 30 is about where I like to keep it. You might not need that much, you might want more, you might want less, but it's a value that you can play with, and if you look at how that treats the edge, you'll see it's actually gone in so far there that it's, it's black now. Um, but this is the light is dropping off. It's at the edge, and so let me go ahead and do a full render. Um, you can see it's dropped off so much now that we'll probably have to increase the cone angle if we want to keep everything lit up. And in this particular circumstance, a drop off of 30 is probably just way more than we need. Um, so we might be able to get away with like five. And then I'll, I'll set the penumbra angle to negative five, and that will give us hopefully a nicer light. Okay. So you can see we've got a much softer edge now, and that's exactly what we want. However, I like the light to kind of soften smoother than it is which is one of the reasons that I don't necessarily use spotlights very often. So this is where I would increase the drop-off value. I'm going to go ahead and kick it to 15, and I'm going to change my cone angle to 120, just to widen it, and we'll take a look at how that looks. Okay, so it's not perfect, but it's pretty good. Um, I'm going to turn on linear decay because I want a little bit of decay, and I'm going to turn my intensity up to 15. And what that's going to do is just kind of give me a base light that, that I like. Um, I think that you, you can see that the results are almost exactly the same as the previous render, but. Um, it's just going to be a little bit nicer. It's going to be a little more realistic. And I'm going to go ahead and add some shadows onto that. So we've got light radius. As we remember, if we want softer shadows, we up the light radius. But I'm going to go to my default and sort of do like 3. And then shadow rays, I'm going to set to 18. Because that's something that generally works for me. And I'm going to render So now, we're really starting to get some real lighting. It's not just that default light anymore. The default light is turned off because we have actual light in our scene. And we're getting uh, you know, nicer, planned out, thought out results. So what I'm going to do now is talk about three-point lighting. Um, Three-point lighting is something that you can look up. It's pretty much a standard. I'm going to go into my top view here. Okay. So in three-point lighting, we have a, a main light that's like right, generally right near the camera, wherever your camera is shooting from. So like I'm going to shoot right here. This is the angle that I want. This is the shot that I want. So my light is going to be you know, right behind, essentially, my camera. And it can be off to the right a little bit, it can be off to the left a little bit. Usually I have it off to the right a little bit. Uh, I like that. Um, but it's called three-point lighting because there's three points of light. So, uh, people will say don't duplicate lights, and you should probably listen to them, but I don't listen to them very often. I duplicate my lights. So I'm just going to duplicate a couple lights here real quick. Um, so I've duplicated that main light, but I'm going to turn off shadows on the other two lights because I don't want shadows on them. I feel like one set of shadows is often enough to give you a good feeling render while still not increasing your render time. Because if I have 18 rays being cast from three different lights, now I've got, you know, that many more rays. I've got 
uh, almost 60 rays now. So, in order to avoid that, I generally keep my shadows just on my, my main light right behind the camera um, so that the shadows are cast behind the objects and away from me, the viewer. Uh, okay, so off to the left here, our secondary light, this is the, the fill light. And you see how I still have, have that target on, so they're all kind of facing the right, the same center point. Um, so this, this fill light, we want to set to a value of an intensity that is generally 50% of whatever that other main light is. So in this case, it would be 7.5. And that's just a, a general area. You could make that anything that you wanted it to be. Uh, you know, it's, it's really what works for your scene, but 7.5 is a number that you can use to, to find a starting point. You know, it's 50% of that other intensity. And then our third light, which is generally off behind the, the objects that we're looking at. Um, this is the backlight, the, uh, you know, the highlight. Um, this is a light that we want to generally keep either 100%, maybe 150%, maybe more, maybe less. Again, it's whatever fits your scene. I generally will go at, at whatever the 100% the intensity is to start with. So like 15 in this case. But I might take it up even more. Maybe I want to try like 20. Um, and the purpose of this light is to create highlights on our shapes. So you may want to adjust it to try and find where it's creating nice rim light, like nice highlights on your, your objects. So sometimes that light has to be at like more of an extreme angle than some of the others. And you'll notice the, the setup of the camera. Or, or, or excuse me, of the lights. Here we have the main light, that fill light, and the back light. It's basically a triangle. So just use that, you know? You know where your, your first light is, so this next light is going to be off here on the back light. So you get that sort of triangular shape. And the other nice thing is you can grab all of these and you can group them. And you can actually group them with your little backdrop if you have that as well. So I'm going to unlock that. If you group all these things and you set the pivot point to the center of, of wherever all your objects are, you can just rotate them all with your camera. So like if I move my camera over this way, I can move all my lights and everything all at once. I'm not actually going to do that. Um, so now we have our three-point lighting set up. This is great because it's it's a setup that works a lot of the time. You know, in almost uh, any circumstance where you're just focusing on like one object or one character, or you have like a, a really small kind of focus, it's really easy to just do like a three-point lighting <laughs> for things that are like environments um, or have a larger scale, a wider scope. You may need more lights, but generally speaking, less is more. Keep it simple. Let's have a look at how this render works. So I've got some pretty nice uh, lighting. It's it looks pretty good. I can see some stuff going on that looks nice. Um, I'm getting some good bounces. The shadows look okay. It's not it's not crazy, but it looks decent. Um, the main thing here is maybe it's not bright enough, and also there's nothing in the environment to reflect really. Um, so I would probably add in like a sky ball with some sort of texture on it of a room that I like, the colors of, not something that I'm going to see in the scene, 
but something that's going to have colors and lights that, that, that will reflect into my objects and make them a little more interesting. Um, I don't think I'm going to go ahead and do that right now for the sake of time, but I am going to make a few changes to my lights because now I'm at that point where I've got the base of what I want, but I, I need to change it. So I'm going to kick this intensity of my main light up to 20 because I want more light in the scene. And I'm also going to kick the cone angle up to 140. I'm going to adjust my fill light to half of what my main light is. So that's 10. And then the, the back light is going to be something that I'm also going to increase. I'm going to kick that all the way up to 30 because I really want to get some, some highlights in there that I'm not really seeing just yet. Um, so I'm just kind of trying to make some changes here and see what I'll like, what I don't like. So now I should have more light in my scene. I like that a lot more already, I can tell. It's just brighter, there's a much nicer focus. That red is really popping out. Um, the ground is a little blown out. It's not too bad though. Um, but it's pretty high contrast. The thing that I don't like about spotlights is that they isolate, you know, that whatever they're focused on, and so you kind of lose the background. The background is no longer there, which might be exactly what you need. That's you know that's why you would use a spotlight is to focus on on something. But in this particular case, I might want to brighten up that background. So this is where I will occasionally bring in a fourth light. And in this case, I'll almost exclusively use a directional light that's pointing straight down or almost straight down. Um, but in this instance, I'm going to use an area light because we haven't talked about an area light yet. I want to get it out of the way. So create an area light. Area lights are directional. They have a focus, so you can see that we're going to focus again on that center area. Um, area lights have one more thing, though, that other lights don't have, really. Um, it has a size. You can see that it's a, a rectangle, and you can actually scale that up. And the scale will affect intensity, and it will also um, affect you know where, where the light is, how, how much light there is. So I'm going to make this pretty large because I'm trying to bring more light into my scene. I want to light up the background a little bit. So I'm going to also uh, raise that up so it's covering everything. And you can see I have no decay here. Um, go ahead and put, well, I'm going to leave it at no decay. And I'm going to set the intensity to 0.1. Maybe we'll try 0.2 actually. Because I want an even distribution of extra light in the scene. I just want to light everything a little bit brighter to even it out, reduce some of that contrast, which is what I'm trying to do right now. You, know, you might not necessarily be wanting to reduce contrast, uh, you know, in which case you probably wouldn't be doing this step. And I'm not going to worry about shadows. I will talk about shadows briefly just because um, area lights have a slightly different shadow setup. They don't have um, a shadow angle. So it just has shadow rays. And it often needs more rays than you would need on other lights. So like the shadow rays may go up to like 60 or something on a, on a light like this easily. Um, it, just, it just needs more rays. Plain and simple. I don't know necessarily why, but it does. And you don't have to worry about the angle, so it's kind of nice. It's, it's straightforward. 
And area lights have some other neat tricks, but they're they're good for things like windows. You can put them like size them to the same shape as the window and just kind of put them like right outside the window. Um, but I'm not going to go into all that right now. I just want to talk sort of about basic light setup. So let's go ahead and take another little render here. I'm going to save this one so that we can see a comparison. And I'm going to do a little render. Now remember, I'm just trying to brighten the whole scene a little bit so that there's more light throughout. And you can see, I mean, I'm doing this in real time. I'm not speeding through the renders or anything. It's going pretty quickly. Um, my computer's not like a supercomputer or anything. It's pretty good, but, um, you know, 36 seconds of render time at 1080p with final gather. And we're getting, you know, you can see the reflections in here. That's nice. And we've got pretty good lighting. The ground plane is white, almost white anyway. It's, it's like a light gray white anyway. That's the material, so that's why we're getting... It's, it's kind of bright. Um, and we lit up the background a little bit with that... with that extra area light. Um, so, that's basically my setup, is, is for a lot of things, it's a nice simple setup that you can use you just do three-point lighting, and occasionally you add in a little extra light. I like to um, group everything so I can rotate it around. I'll, sh I'll show you how that works, too. If I have my group, I don't need to worry about the area light, because it's just going to be over everything anyway. But so, like, I'll find my angle. Maybe I want to shoot them from this side now. But I want that consistent lighting still. And I want my backdrop behind it still. So I just move it. I just rotate it right around. And now I can re oops, one button. Now I can render it again. And I'll still have my same lighting rig. But now it's just at a different angle. And so you can see the shadows are, are still behind the objects. And if if you're doing a high quality render, you may want to go ahead and turn on shadows on some of the other ones so you're getting like three shadows or whatever, but maybe you just want shadows on two lights, you want the main light and the fill light. I almost never put the shadows on the backlight because it's going to end up casting shadows like sort of towards you. I don't really like that. Um, but if it works for your scene, do it. You know? It's really just assess the needs of your scene. And, and act on that. So I guess that's basically it. That kind of everything you need to know about the basics of setting up just some nice lighting for maybe rendering a, a single object or maybe you're rendering a, a character or a face or whatever it is. If it's kind of like a smaller in scope generally. If you're lighting a whole room that's a little bit different. That's more of a complex um, thing where you might need different lights to kind of act as like bounce lights and different things like that. But it's pretty simple. Just triangular shape, 100%, 50%, 150%. That's your main, your fill, and your backlight. Um, and then sometimes like an overhead light is nice. Usually I, I use um, just directional lights instead of spotlights and often I won't need a uh, I won't need an overhead light for that. And um, one other little thing I'll just say real quick is when you're modeling, this will help you out so much if you add edge loops onto edges like this, okay? Sharp edges don't look realistic. In reality, nothing is, is a perfect edge. It's maybe like a samurai sword or something, I guess, but even that wouldn't be 100%. So 
if you add these little edges in here and then you kind of like smooth out your, your object you get edges that are less sharp so like I'll just go along and put edges edge loops on all the edges now obviously if you if you're modeling for games or something you want to do this or you, you kind of do still but you just do it differently um, so you just add your little edge loops in there and then you can smooth your object and the edges now are still sharp because I put the edge loops so close but they're not perfectly sharp and let me um, render that it, it looks more realistic <clears throat> that's kind of like totally unrelated to the lighting subject but it's just a mistake that a lot of people make so if you want your work to look more realistic soften those edges up just a little bit and it will make, make things feel more realistic because the light isn't just hitting like a perfectly sharp thing anymore now it's got a little bit of a curvature to it and so it's going to feel more realistic because in, in reality nothing has that perfect edge so keep that in mind um, you know, realistic renders are, are achieved through imperfections you have to add in imperfections so it's a subtle difference but it's it's there and well, that's that I hope you learned a little something about lighting and how to make it look nice um, at least basic lighting setups and maybe next time we'll go into a little more detail or talk about adding like a an HDR um, image for reflections and stuff I don't know we'll see what happens anyway talk to you later oh don't forget to like my videos and subscribe and all that good stuff that makes me feel good when I look at my analytics. Alright, thanks. Bye.